Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Dr. Merrill Winston, and welcome to Where Do You Think You're Going? So this is an, the, um, an analysis I did of uh, the treatment of uh, wandering and elopement in school settings. So let's go ahead and uh, get down into it. Uh, this is hosted by the um, CARD Center for Autism Related Disabilities at Florida Atlantic University and the Partnership for Effective Programs of Students with Autism. The, uh, the mission at the FAU Center for Autism Related Disabilities provides expert consulting training and support at no charge for all people across all race, ethnic, and gender groups with autism related disabilities, their families, employers, professionals, community, and governmental agencies serving them. The vision of the CARD Center provides support and assistance with the goal of optimizing the potential of all people across all race, ethnic, and gender groups with autism related disabilities. They serve five counties. And they have three offices. And they offer these services at no charge, family and school consultations, trainings and workshops, public education, referrals and resources, adults, hangout groups, and much more. My website is Winston Behavioral Solutions, and I do behavioral consultations, presentations, and expert witnessing. So you're seeing the presentation part right now. And that's where you can find me. I'd like to start off with a quote from uh, Dr. Jim Partington that I learned from him many, many years ago. And that is that uh, we, want, we don't want our kids running from us. We want our kids running to us. And um, generally speaking, if they're running from you or away from you, as you know, there's a problem. And that, that shouldn't be what's happening. They should be running to us. And if they're not, we're going to have to start rethinking things. So quick overview. Uh, we're going to talk about elopement. And I've defined each one of these for our purposes here. But I'm defining elopement as out of the room or setting. So if it's a classroom, they're out of the room. If they're in you know, a gym class out on the basketball court, they're away from the court. That would be elopement. So they're out of the room or the setting completely. Wandering, that's within the room or setting. Um, going from place to place, never truly engaging. And people do this too. Out of area, not wandering, staying in place. You're staying in one place, but you're not where you should be. And out of seat, that's where you're in area and you're next to your seat, but you're not in your seat. These problems are all tied to local rates of reinforcement. So what the, when I say local rates of reinforcement, I mean, what is available to the student at this second? Not what is promised an hour later or even five minutes later. What is available right now? And most of the things that are available right now are not programmed reinforcers. They're all the ones flying all around the kid. Interactions, other people, uncontrolled toys and activities and things like that. Those are your local rates of reinforcement. If I tease somebody and they do something, that's local rates of reinforcement. That's what I can produce right now with nobody else needed, like no teacher giving me stuff. So quick... Uh, a view uh, overview of elopement. Uh, we're going to look at some different categories of elopement, which is usually when people elope, they're running. Uh, running from aversives, running to access reinforcers, locations, people, activities, tangibles. Running to access being chased as a reinforcer, that's a whole different one. Running as confrontation seeking, we'll talk about that too. The reinforcer is not getting chased. It's forcing you to grab them so that they can get into a fight with you. Quite a bit different. Um, these categories are not mutually exclusive. What do I mean by that? There could be several functions. Person could be running for several reasons. So maybe they did want to escape and they also like being chased. So, you know, you could have a basic problem that's made worse by other things that come up. So you could have several of these acting together. That's why if you're dealing with somebody who's eloping or not where they should be, please don't grasp at procedures. Like I'll give you a few procedures in here. Don't grasp at them and start plugging them in. 
Job one is figuring out what is going on here. If you don't know what's going on with the student running away or being out of area, if you're not sure what's going on, you shouldn't just start throwing procedures at it. Uh, overview of wandering. And again, we'll take each one of these in detail as we go through them. This is just a kind of where we're going. Um, variables that may increase wandering. Low rates of reinforcement. By the way, all of these problems, um, except for the kid just hates what you're doing, all of these problems are tied to each other through low rates of reinforcement. Generally speaking, if somebody is copying a very high rate of reinforcement, having a wonderful time, getting all kinds of great stuff very quickly at large levels, people don't run from that situation. People run to those situations. Um, high task difficulty. Sure, that'll make you want to wander. Uh, distractors. Um, and sometimes they're aversive. They bother you. But usually the distractors and wandering are reinforcers, positive reinforcers. Uh, reinforcers in the immediate environment. It could be aversives, not the task itself, but some aversives related to the task. Different types of wandering. We'll talk about uh, work request wandering. That's initiation. That means you don't start. Multiple mid-task wandering, where you keep interrupting yourself in the middle of your task, which is very common for higher functioning individuals who are supposed to be working independently. Intertask wandering, kind of a transition problem, but not, not that you're having a behavior problem, but that as soon as you leave one task, it's going to be several minutes before you start the next one, and you're supposed to go right into it. So that would be wandering when you complete a task and not starting the other one in a timely manner. And then um, out of area, going to a specific location within the room setting and remaining until redirected. A lot of times it's something that somebody is highly interested in that's not what they're supposed to be doing. So you could be out of area observing. And I've seen individuals, students do this. They're curious about what's going on, but they're not engaged, but they're standing, sitting near someone, something and watching. Out of area participating, they're actually partaking, playing, answering questions, whatever everybody else is doing, they're joining. And out of area aggravating, which is you weren't having fun, so you thought you'd go stir some stuff up somewhere else, but it's all out of area. And finally, it's going to be out of seat, and we'll take a look at this as well. And so the individual stays in the area, but they're constantly up and down in their seat. Like they don't, they don't leave the area of their desk, but they, they just having trouble staying seated. Uh, primarily, this is task avoidance. It can be, uh, there are different things that it can be functioning as. It can be primarily task avoided. It can be primarily an attempt to increase the rate of reinforcement. Um, and it can be just sitting for a certain duration of minutes under these conditions acquires aversive properties. Like you're okay for a few minutes, but after 10 or 15, you've had it. Okay, so that was the um, overview. And now we're going to look at each one of these independently and talk about some of the different functions, some of the different contexts, some of the different reasons why these things happen. And again, you're going to have to look at each individual case yourself. You don't want to just start throwing procedures at things. Just because somebody runs out of the room doesn't mean they're all running out of the room for the same reason. And it doesn't mean you just throw the same procedure at it. The most important thing is not simply to make the elopement stop. That is important. The most important thing is to understand why it's happening, because there's a lot of ways to make it stop temporarily. But if you don't really understand why it's happening, it's going to come back in some other way. So first of all, elopement, leaving the room or setting without permission. Now, typically, this is running. Now, I guess it could be elopement as well. If a higher functioning student says, screw you. I'm out of here. And they just calmly walk out of the room. It's technically still elopement. But usually when people talk about that, they usually mean they got a runner. Um, and it is a bit different with a higher functioning person that says, screw you guys, like Eric Cartman. Screw you guys, I'm going home. OK, <laughs> and that if they do something like that, that's a bit different. And, and we can talk about that as well. Um, primary maintaining variables for elopement. One. Access reinforcement outside of the room or setting. Um, and usually they're going to a specific area. 
Two, escape from aversive stimulation. Somebody's had it with the teacher. They've had it with other students. They've been teased too much. The work is too hard, whatever. Um, but they straight up, they're not trying to go get something they love. They just want out. And this would be characteristic of a student who left the room and just sat outside the door. Like they didn't want to go anywhere. They just did. You just wanted to get out. Right. So that would be more like escape from reversive stimulation. And certainly if they calmed down once they got out and they just hung out, that's probably what it was. Um, access to being chased. These are the people that are running. If you want to be chased, you don't walk out of the room. You bolt. OK. And you go fast. Something that demands that somebody come after you. Right. Now, it could also be, and we'll get into the details on it, a form of what I like to call confrontation seeking, which is picking a fight, um, in which the primary maintaining variable is they really just want to get into a fight with you and hurt you. Um, and they're using running as a means for you to come after them and tell them no and grab them, and then they attack you. So if you know anybody that kind of works like that, it could be that. Um, usually confrontation seeking is with higher functioning individuals with decent language. Um, uh, so, all right, usually higher functioning people, um, like a high functioning 10 year old, they usually don't run out of the room. That's usually a lower functioning child thing to do. And one of the reasons is they don't have a large repertoire of things to engage the grown up, So they know how to run, um, higher functioning people usually do a bunch of other different stuff, but they could run too. Um, so. If, it, if the elopement is accessing a specific reinforcer, um, and as always, job number one is finding out what are the primary maintaining variables for this person eloping. If the behavior is maintained by access to specific items or places, then the individual typically runs to the same place. So it might be like if they love the, you know, the trampoline, they run to where the trampoline is. They run to where the pool is. They run to where their favorite staff member is. They run to where the swing set is. They run to the um, to the bus circle because they're hoping mommy is there to get them out of here. Um, any one of those things, right, um, would be that would might be access to a specific reinforcer. If this is the case, um, then one tactic is to teach the child how to appropriately access that place. Now, this is not always feasible or practical, okay? Um, so you may have to use other um, strategies. Many individuals, and if you're dealing with somebody who's lower functioning, no or poor language, younger, right? Um, these individuals typically can't tell time, even typically developing children with, with language. Um, they can't tell time. They don't know when certain events are supposed to happen, right? And they may just run in hopes that it's time. Um, in the case of not knowing when it's time to go home, and I've seen this with a number of individuals who they would grab their backpack, kind of, which is what they do before they go, indicating a, an MO is present, a motivator is present for them to go home. And so when they've had it, even if it's in the morning, they'll grab their backpack and go for the door. They don't know it's not time to go home. And so um, one of the things you can do is make a task-based clock and basically use backward chaining. So the way it works is every day when it is time to go home, you have them do a very short task, like five seconds, just put this in here, whatever, it doesn't matter. Just do something that is a thing that's consistent that they can do again. And it should be very easy and very fast. So um, you just do one task, very short, five seconds, 10 seconds, right? Um, before leaving, so that there is always a predictable pattern of events that happen since you can't tell time. When the task is completed, the teacher gives the student a picture of, and we've done this before, the bus loop um, or mommy's car, it, uh, assuming that they understand what these things are. That is that they're meaningful for the individual. If they're not, I, if you're not sure, you'd have to test for it. But assuming that the individual recognizes mommy's car, mommy, their house, et cetera, then it could be a picture of these, um, of these kinds of things, right? And you use it as a token, basically. Um, so before being allowed to leave the room, the child would exchange a photo for access to the bus loop, 
right? Um, which is kind of like a picture-based hall pass, if you will. Here's the idea. What they learn is, and by the way, if they try to bolt, you'd always bring them back. And what they learn is there's a right way to get out of the door. There's a certain sequence to get out of the door. And if you do this little sequence and you hand the card, you get out of the door and it's always time to go home. And so what you're trying to do is create predictability in a sequence of events for when it's time to go home. As an example, if they were running to access the bus loop, um, just to give you an example. Once this routine is well established, then tasks can be added to make things longer, right? And you could keep it instead of starting the task at 2.30 when it's time to go home, you start a set of tasks at two o'clock, then you start tasks at one o'clock, et cetera. Each one leading to the next, um, and what you can do is you can, instead of hurting the whole photo, you can laminate the photo, cut it up into pieces, Velcro it. So you could have four pieces of a photograph. After each of four tasks they do, they get a piece of the puzzle. And when all the pieces are together, it makes the photo of the bus loop or mommy or whatever, hand it to the teacher and you're out the door. So there's a lot of ways to do this. There's a lot of flexibility in this, but here's the main thing to keep in mind. If they're trying to access a specific place, right? We're trying to teach them, get it under stimulus control. When is the right time to go out the door with your backpack? It's after you do this task, this task, this task, this task, hand me a picture and then we go. And it becomes a pattern. That way there's no more guessing and constantly running to the door. Maybe today is time to go. Maybe now it's time to go. It will make the time to go predictable for those who can't tell time. So that's something you can do if you're dealing with a particular elopement like this. Photos can be laminated, cut up like puzzle pieces, as I said. And, you know, depending on the individual's level of functioning and, and what their tolerance level is, you could cut it up into 10 pieces and use it all throughout the day. So when the end of the day is, you have a big picture and you exchange it and you're good to go. And hopefully those picture pieces would be established as condition reinforcers, but who knows? So when the picture is complete, hand it to the teacher and you get access. So um, procedures like these should bring the behavior of walking through the door under what we call stimulus control. Only try to walk through the door when you hand a picture. If you don't hand the picture, that's your pass to get out the door. You need that picture and the picture becomes important, right? Um, if you're, stop, uh, you're stopped, if you don't have a picture to exchange, if they really wanna go out and there's no time for a task, just give them the whole picture and then give it right back to you. It doesn't matter. Here's what's important. They don't get out the door without the picture. Every time they make it out the door without the picture, it breaks the conditioning you're trying to get going, right? You want to teach them you need the picture. The picture is important. The picture is what lets you leave, right? Um, if they can leave whenever they want, the picture is worthless. So you do have to prevent them from leaving if they don't have the picture. If they're constantly trying to leave and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to prevent it. Well, then give them the picture, let them hand it to you, and then let them leave and go with them. At least that way, they've given you the picture first and you're maintaining your consistency for how do I get out of the room? The only thing that's going to change is what do I got to do to get the picture, right? And so that may change from time to time. All right. The procedure should teach appropriate access to outside the room setting as well, as well as when that access will be granted. It makes it predictable so that people won't have to keep guessing and running and running, right? And you have to deal with intermittent reinforcement and stuff like that. So the closer the puzzle is to being completed, the closer they are to leaving the room. Now, they may not understand that. So you might have to do a number of things, a line, something that fills up, something that's more visual. Um, but I, ideally, you'd want them to have some indication that they're closer to going. But depending on their level of functioning, they may not benefit from any of those things. But it's something that you can try. This strategy is not likely to work if the behavior is maintained by other variables. So if the behavior is maintained by, a, by escape from aversive stimulation, they don't care about the bus loop, they just want to get the hell out of the class, and this is not going to work. That's why it's vitally important to understand what's going on, and then you can understand how to approach it. So um, another strategy is to bring that reinforcer to the classroom when possible, 
and use it to motivate the student. They were running to where the mini tramp is. Well, let's bring the mini tramp into the classroom. Well, you can't always do that. Maybe you can do it. You do it if you can, if it's feasible, if it's practical. If they're constantly running to the mini tramp, maybe we should be using the mini tramp to reinforce small amounts of work in the classroom. And then when they see it's right there and we show them how to access it by completing a small amount of work, we can stop all this damn running. So if the student was simply trying to access that specific reinforcer, then the availability of that reinforcer, and it should be made available as easy as easily as running to it, right? If it's not too hard to get it, then they won't, they'll stop running. It's, a, it's an easy probe to do. It's also possible that the individual is simply escaping from aversive stimulation. So especially if the environment is unfamiliar, it's excessively noisy, they don't like the teacher, they don't like other students, it's hot, it's bothersome, it could be any of a variety of problems. Um, the individual could also be uh, escaping from tasks or individuals. In the case of a higher functioning student, good language, like an older student, for example, 12, 13 years old, who is angry at the teacher, uh, it's very common, I'm out of here. They'll just, they'll just tell you, I, I, I've had it, right? Just like any of us would. This is probably the least likely maintaining variable as um, most individuals don't usually flee when they're irritated by the teacher. Um, typically, they stay in place and become aggressive and name call. And um, those of you who teach might even notice that many times if the student is higher functioning and you demand that they go to the office, they refuse. And one of the reasons is they want to stay where they are and stir things up, right? So um, a lot of times if it becomes highly aversive in the environment, I, it's been my experience that especially young individuals who are lower functioning, they typically don't run out of the room because they're having a bad time. They typically stay where they are and attack somebody. Um, the ones that have the devil in them and the devilish grin and take off running, they're usually not angry. Um, so it really depends. You have to look at the affect and a number of other things when you're trying to figure out what's going on here. So um, if the individual were only motivated to escape the current environment, um, then as with being chased, they won't likely run to a specific location each time. Uh, like our little friend here, they may just stand outside the door of the classroom in the hallway or sit outside the door of the classroom in the hallway. So like if they leave the classroom without permission and just sit in the hallway, then they, there's no big reinforcer they're searching for probably, unless it's just the attention of a passerby, which that could be as well. But um, if it's just that they just wanted to get away from the teacher, the task, another student, they might just leave the room and stand right outside the room. And if they don't go anywhere, then it may be just simply something in there is aversive and they just needed uh, to time themselves out. So they're simply running to avoid being, uh, many individuals, if they do run, then they're running to avoid being brought back in, not because they want to go somewhere. They're just afraid you're going to make them go back in. So if they just wanted to be outside and you like don't chase them, then they might not run at all. Um, furthermore, individuals who just want out will not typically look mischievous they, or happy. They usually will look angry. So it typically, if somebody's escaping because it's aversive stimulation, usually when we're under aversive stimulation, we don't look too happy. If they're bored and they need some excitement and they got the devilish grin, that's a little bit different. Um, and so it may not be escape from aversive stimulation. It may be escape from boredom, which is a little bit different. People don't look angry then. Um, older, higher functioning individuals are also less likely to just suddenly bolt. Um, they just usually stroll out or just say, I'm gone or something like that. They don't like suddenly run like they're expecting to be chased. That's usually a small child behavior or the behavior of somebody who doesn't have good language. So with escape from aversive stimulation, 
Um, if observations and data indicate that the individual is leading to escape from a specific aversive event, being teased by other students, being corrected by the teacher, extreme noise, etc., then the course of action is to decide if, one, the aversive event can or should be removed. That is, if the student is escaping from the room because he's being teased constantly, then the teasing needs to be addressed. People shouldn't be teased. It's, it's I mean, yeah, everybody's going to get teased once in a while, but if it's like a constant thing, that needs to stop. So that maybe can be removed, possibly. Two, the aversive event may be quite common for all people. Being asked to correct an error being asked if you can sit down again because it's not time to get up and move around. Um, just a very common request, okay? And the individual, then the individual needs to learn coping strategies to minimize the chances of elopement. So as an example, many higher function students, they don't like being corrected. I don't either in particular, but I deal with it. But they don't like being corrected. And uh, when you correct them, they spool up, get pissed off, and they escape. Um, when really we should be focusing on teaching them how to handle corrections, okay, properly, right, and reinforcing that behavior. The aversive event can also be modified slightly so that it will no longer produce elopement, which is an antecedent manipulation, which are sometimes appropriate. So, you know, one of my favorite ones, instead of saying, okay, it's time to work, say, hey, what do you want to earn today? Um, because it puts the focus on stuff that you're getting. It's just a little trick. Sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't. Um, but it's a good way to use it because you're not talking about work. And you're also assessing for motivation because when you say, hey, what do you want to work for today? If they say nothing, you know, it's going to be a rough day. So it's good to, it's a good thing to ask. Now, what if they do have the devil in them? And they do want to be chased and they do have the devilish grin and they love it. And I've, I've run into a few kids. Well, not run into them, but run after them. I've run after a few kids. Luckily I could chase them because I had a longer stride. Um, but I've, I've run after a few kids who did this kind of thing. And they're the ones that are, they're the ones doing this. Um, so that's, it's usually pretty clear to the grownups who's doing this. Um, so what are the primary motivators for wanting? And here's the question. Let's say that you like it. Well, why are you doing it right now? Okay. You know, there's a lot of things people like, but the issue is, why are you trying to get access to it at this moment? Right? So one, it's a means to an end. So there's low rates of reinforcement coupled with a restricted repertoire. Let's say I'm, I'm a lower functioning individual. I don't have language. I don't even have any play skills, which is typical of a lot of children who are younger and don't have language. They, they haven't learned how to play with other kids by themselves or even with an adult. So um, if you have a restricted repertoire of behaviors, there's not that much you can do that will produce a big jazzy excitement, right? Um, you can't tell a joke. You can't do something astonishing. And what can you do? You can hurt somebody. Or you can run. Okay. There's not a lot of stuff to do. What can cause a huge amount of social reinforcement instantly? <laughs> Bolt, run out of the room. Someone will come. Um, so it, in this case, it, it's not that they love running so much or even being chased. It may not be their favorite thing but they want some action, any kind of an action. And it's really all they know how to do to start up some action, okay? So in that case, it, it's not so much, oh my God, I just wanna be chased all the time. It might be, oh my God, I don't know what else to do with grownups. So don't, um, don't be confused that because someone has a restricted repertoire, don't assume automatically they love that thing the most. Um, there was a movie with Robin Williams where he played a Russian immigrant and, um, the, a line in the movie was, you know, when I first don't come to country, I always ask for ham sandwich because it's the only thing I know how to say. I hate ham sandwiches. So it, it's the same thing. Like he ate ham sandwiches all the time. He doesn't know what to ask for. And you think, oh my God, this guy loves ham sandwiches. No, no, he didn't. Not in particular. Right. 
And this can be that same kind of problem. No, maybe I would like something more than running, right? But I, I don't know what else to do. Maybe I would do something standing still if it were fun, right? So this is uh, the way you might start thinking about these problems. Two, instead of a means to an end, like I just want excitement, I don't care how it is, which is a means to an end. Two, it is the end. They absolutely love running, love watching grownups chase them. They think it's the best thing ever and they do it every chance they get and they love it and they would choose it out of a lineup. OK, so that happens, too, where they just love being chased and many typically developing children love it. OK, my dog loves it. So it is it's quite common for people to like this activity. The game tag played by children. That's about being chased. So um, it should not be surprising that a certain percentage of children will love being chased, just like people love chocolate. Right. Um, so that can happen, too. So this likely also reflects a restricted repertoire of social interactions, right? So if it, for a means to an end treatment option, like chase, being chased is not the thing I love most, but I don't know what else to do, right? Then we want to um, increase local rates of reinforcement in the current setting um, that they elope from. Uh, and you'd wanna know What's the count per minute of reinforcement? How much reinforcement are they getting? If the reinforcement is coming fast and furious, people tend not to elope. People tend to elope when the rate of reinforcement goes low and the rate of reversement gets high. Everybody bolts in one way or another. Um, so what reinforcers are being delivered at this rate? So if you say the rate of reinforcement is one a minute, what are they getting every minute? Good boy, a Skittle, a gold star, airplane ride, five seconds of iPad, what are, pardon me, what are they getting? So example, verbal praise every five minutes while on task is not a real high rate of reinforcement and it's probably not real big reinforcement. Example, one skittle every two minutes while on task, at least that's clear what they're getting. So other treatment directions, teach other ways for the individual to produce fast, big social reinforcement uh, must ultimately be unprompted to be useful. Anytime you're teaching somebody a new way to interact with someone to get some social reinforcement, don't make the mistake of prompting it all the time. Because remember, when they, they don't need any prompts to elope, they can do that all by themselves. They don't need any assistance. They don't need any prompts. They can do it completely independently. So whatever you teach them to do, that's fun with a grown up. They have to be able to initiate it on their own with no prompting for it to compete with eloping because eloping they do independently. So if you get into a situation, they can elope independently, but I taught them this fun game, but they won't do it on their own. I have to prompt them. Well, the only time you're going to prompt them is when they tried to elope because that's when you're going to know they needed some action. So that's why it's vitally important for anything that you teach them. You, they've got to be able to do it on their own because they do problem behavior unprompted, right? When was the last time you saw somebody go up to a kid and say, hey, don't forget to elope today, okay? You know, you need to be able to do that on your own. I don't want to keep reminding you to elope. You need to be independent. Um, kids know how to do bad behavior all by themselves. And if you're going to teach them good behavior, that's got to be independent too. So remember, no one, no one prompts them to run out of the room. Um, I don't think. Okay. So number three, the individual's confrontation seeking. Um, oh, by the way, I'm sorry, I didn't mention this. If they love to run just to run, then the then the answer is they earn that as a reinforcer. And you bring it under stimulus control and you teach them how to run when to run, they have to learn how to stop, they have to learn how to come back. And for somebody to be a responsible runner, like to play catch me, you can teach that, but you probably want to teach it in a fenced in area. But for somebody who loves to run, I'm just saying this, it's harder to do, but it is an option. And the best option, if you can do it, is teach them under which conditions may you run. And if you 
if you do ABC and you ask to be chased, right, then I will do it. One teacher that I used to work with, she was wonderful. Um, and what she did was she found out the kid, um, he would manned request for monster and he would do this. And when he did that, his teacher, who was awesome, she would chase him around the room like monster. She'd be the monster and she'd chase him around. And so he'd do something for her and she'd say, what do you want? And he'd do this and she'd go, I'm going to get you. And he would squeal and run around and he loved it. And as long as he could access that, he didn't need to bolt from the classroom because she made it really fun. And he learned how to ask to be chased monster right? So that is a thing you can do. And maybe you just chase them around the room a little bit. But the, the point is, it's way better than chasing them down the hall. And you can always change it into something else later. Um, so in this case, the ultimate, uh, in the case of access to being chased as confrontation seeking, you can see this in high, func high functioning kids won't likely bolt. They might. Lower functioning kids will do it because they don't know how else to bait you into grabbing them. And so um, whether they're high or low functioning, the, both people could do this because you don't have to be very sophisticated to run. And also, you don't have to be too sophisticated to learn that people will come get you, right? And that they'll put hands on you and then, then you can attack them. So if this is the case... And the person is running, especially with higher functioning individuals, um, what they're doing is they're duping you into grabbing them so they can punch you. And the reason high functioning people do this is they understand about wrong and right, fair and unfair. He started it. He deserved it. He, they grabbed me first. They deserve to get hit. They understand all these concepts. And because of that, they don't just run up and punch the teacher they do something to bait the teacher into telling them, no, stop, you can't do that, putting a hand on them. So if I want to get into it with the teacher, all I do is I run out of the room because I know somebody's going to come get me. And when they grab me, that's when I go off on them. Many people do this kind of a thing. They don't typically do it through elopement. They typically do it by challenging in other ways. I'm not taking my meds. I'm not doing this damn homework. You can't make me do ABC. It's usually a challenge like that. And then the person says, oh, yes, you are. And then it's a fight. So it's usually this posturing back and forth. But it can just be bolting out of the room and somebody saying stop and trying to grab you. And then boom, it goes. So if you see that pattern all the time, um, if they're just giggling when you grab them and like little kids, like they run and you grab them and they giggle and then drop so that you can keep playing the game, then that's something different. That's not the confrontation seeking. Confrontation seeking, they want to get into a fight with you and they want to hurt you and they want to, they want to legitimize their attack by making you come put hands on them. So that could be one of the functions, but I don't think this is the most frequent one you'll see. So the student, in essence, tricks you into laying hands on them. Um, I just heard of this happening in the school, but I don't think the student wanted them to lay hands on them. But it ended up they laid hands on him because he was walking away. But that's typically the kind of thing some individuals will do. Uh, these individuals are typically breaking specific rules, by the way, that they are acutely aware of. Like it's not an accident. If it's if it's confrontation seeking, they are purposely breaking rules that they know will make you go get them or put hands on them. Um, and that happens quite frequently, too, with our higher functioning kiddos. So um, they are typically aggressive, higher functioning. They're aware of social room, rules, customs like he started it. It's not my fault. You deserve it. These kinds of things. All things being equal, lower functioning individuals who are not well socialized, they don't need a reason to hit you to justify it in their own mind so they don't feel bad. <laughs> They're just busy hitting you. They don't have to come up with a rationale. Higher functioning people that understand concepts like you were good, you were naughty, it was your fault, blame. People who understand things like this, there's value in um, putting it off on somebody else, right? And you want to feel you want to feel justified in your actions. You don't want to feel bad for what you did. People who are lower functioning like that 
tend to not need reasons. They just bite you. Um, so what if it is confrontation seeking? Then it may be uh, only one of a variety of behaviors performed to cause a confrontation. If it is confrontation seeking, usually you see all kinds, not simply running. It'd be refusing to do things, yesing all your no's, saying no to all your yeses, contradicting you at every possible chance they have, like a student with oppositional defiant disorder, you might see some stuff like that. So it, if it is confrontation seeking, it's probably not the only kind that they do. Um, the way to treat this problem is by addressing the motivators that cause the student to seek opportunities for aggression. Really the treatment, if it is confrontation seeking, it's figuring out, usually people do that when something's bothering them. Something has happened to them, somebody was mean to them. And what they're doing is they're doing counter control. So um, a lot of times you'll see confrontation seeking if somebody said, you need to do this right now. And it made them very angry. And so they went and took it out on somebody else. They started a fight with another child. So that, that it usually starts with aversive stimulation. The person brews with it for a little while. You know, they think about it and then they want to attack somebody because they feel um, agitated. They want to take it out on somebody. It's a very common phenomenon. So here's the good news. It's likely that a very small percent of all elopement involves clear confrontation seeking. I don't see it that much. Um, that ends with aggression. If it constantly ends with aggression, so if they constantly leave the room and as soon as you try and stop them, they don't simply try to get away and keep running or giggle. They immediately attack you badly. That might be the confrontation seeking thing. Um, anyway, it's something to look out for. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit. We're going to shift gears and talk a little bit about wandering. We're about 40 minutes now. Um, so now remember, if you're not where you should be, elopement, not where you should be. Wandering, not where you should be. If you're not where you should be, there's probably not a very high rate of reinforcement where you should be because as they say, uh, behavior goes where reinforcement flows. So if the reinforcement is flowing fast and furious, behavior stays where it is, okay? But if it isn't, then behavior goes, goes somewhere else. That's what we do as organisms. We're always trying to maximize our rates of reinforcement. So variables that may increase wandering, low rates of reinforcement during the task, high task difficulty, Distractors, stimuli that increase wandering. Usually these distractors are um, potential reinforcers in the environment. So they could be reinforcers. They could be aversives, um, noises. It's too hot. They don't like the chair they're in. The pencil they're using hurts their hand. Just like little things like that that might bother us. Uh, different types of wandering that we'll look at. Work request wandering, which is a failure to initiate Okay, all right, go get your folder and go get your seat and get started. And they go, okay, and they start walking towards it. And then 10 minutes later, they're not doing it. Multiple mid-task wandering. You're usually going to see this. I see this most of the time in like an EBD classroom. Let's say it's got like 10 kids. There's a teacher. They're supposed to be doing something independently at their seat, a worksheet, reading, whatever, okay? And multiple times while they're working, the student self interrupts. I don't understand this. They get up out of their seat. They mess with their peer. They ask to sharpen their pencil. They, there is no solid work for more than a few seconds at a time. Um, and, and if you really watch them, you see this amazing level of self interruption while they're working. And they'll talk about intertask wandering. Um, this is not a transition problem in the usual sense where the person, when you say, okay, it's time to go to music, they explode. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about they leave the task they just did. They're supposed to go to the next one, but they get distracted on the way between one task and another. That's what we're talking about. A couple notes about people who wander. So again, wandering is you're all over the classroom or area. Wandering in general is likely to be more of a problem with unsupervised individuals, first of all. 
who allegedly are working independently. They're further away from the teacher or the authority figure. So it's easy to get up out of your desk and wander around in some other area, right? And then usually there's a gap of supervision. The teacher turns around to help somebody, boom, wandering. Uh, compare this with a student working in a one-on-one -on -one with the teacher. Teacher's in the chair, therapist in the chair, students directly across from them, or they're both sitting at the table, right? This student's more likely to have out of seat problems because the teacher will redirect them most likely before they wander. Wandering tends to be more of a problem from students who are allegedly independent, right? But they're not because they keep getting up and wandering. So here's the good news about those who wander. They want something. They want something that isn't where they are. If they didn't want something that wasn't where they are, they wouldn't be wandering. Okay, it, it expends a lot of energy, right? So they want something. Now, if, if the work isn't just bothering them, if they're leaving because they're kind of bored, which is usually what it is, then they want something. They are seeking something, attention, tangibles, whatever. But it's not because, oh my God, I can't stand it anymore. It's, uh, this is not fun. I think I'm going to look for something else. It's more like that. So individuals with few reinforcers available or those with very low motivation, they tend to stay in one place, right? I actually will do that when we're not sure what's going on. I'll say, nobody talk to the kid. Don't do anything with the kid. Don't ask them to do anything. Don't redirect them. Just kind of ignore them for a while. And we'll say, I just want to see where he goes, if he goes anywhere. And I and I'll, a lot of them, they'll walk around and I just see where they walk and how long they spend in each area. And then you get an idea of, what they actually want because they will take their body to the places that has the most reinforcement. Um, so types of wandering, let's start on this. Initiation wandering. Uh, an instruction is given and the individual wanders on the way to carrying out the instruction. So as an example, Joey, go get your red folder. He doesn't have to do an assignment. You just want him to go get his folder and bring it back, right? Joey gets up, takes two steps towards the folder, starts to wander over to another student's desk and looks at what he's doing. It's very common, right? In this case, it's not that the individual became bored or frustrated. He hadn't even started anything yet, okay? This sort of problem would be more related to reinforcing distractors in the environment. I went to go get it, but then I saw this kid doing something fun and I want in, something like that, right? It could be avoidance of what's coming up, if they know it's coming up and they hate it, sure. This is also less likely to be a problem of high task difficulty. Again, the student was only asked to get his red folder. So it's not like an escape avoidance thing, unless they know the red folder has math in it. They hate math. And yeah, yeah, it could be. Um, for this type of problem, you can focus on eliminating distractors and or providing specific reinforcement for responding to an instruction quickly. So a lot of individuals, there's no contingency on respond to what I said quickly and get something extra. So if you do it within two minutes, there's nothing extra. If I say, hey, go get your red folder and you're here in five seconds, you do get something extra, just as an example. A lot of times there's really no contingency on please start what I ask you to start immediately. And if you do, good things happen. There's usually no contingencies on that. So you can just make one. It's not that hard. If distractors are social interactions from other students, which they often are, right? Or other staff, right? It's possible to arrange contingencies so that the other students provide very low social reinforcement. So we tell them, look, if Joey tries to start up with you, you can get extra prize box tickets if you just say, sorry, I got to get this work done, right? And that will cut off the reinforcement for the other individual. And I've seen people use contingencies like that. And those can be very effective. If you control the other people in the social environment, then you can, you can control the individual you're having problems with. So um, an individual may have, with what about multiple mid-task wandering? So the individual may have no problem starting a task. That's usually the easiest part, uh, but just starting to do something. If the task takes several minutes, unlike bring me your red folder, which just takes a second, right? You might have to start looking at the rate of reinforcement issues during the task. 
and even condition reinforcers. Also look at the rate of non-program reinforcement for going off task. So that's important too, attention from peers. So typically the rate of non-program reinforcement, your peers talking back to you or laughing at something funny you said, and that rate is usually very high in a classroom that's not well managed because everybody's talking to each other all the time. And if people can manage to talk to each other, look at each other, acknowledge each other, you're not usually controlling the reinforcement too well. This can be straight up escape maintain behavior where the task becomes aversive over the duration of the session, which can happen. Like I was okay for the first five minutes, but after 10 or 15, I'm ready to get out of here, right? Or it could be more of a, I'm bored. Like, I don't hate this. It's just boring. I can do it. It's just boring. I'd rather do something fun, right? And then, so somebody is just seeking other reinforcers. It's not that, oh my God, I hate this so much. It's horrible. So sometimes um, frequent mid-task wandering reflects uh, difficulty performing continuous work without self-interruption. I've seen this a lot in EBD classrooms. So many students who wander in this manner, they also have difficulty tolerating low rates of reinforcement. It's one of the reasons they wander. That is, what becomes aversive is doing something boring. And I just can't sit and do it. I need more stimulation, right? Now, it just because they have difficulty doing it doesn't mean they can't. It just means they have difficulty. Like you might have difficulty doing push-ups. It doesn't mean you can never do them. It means you can't do them right now, okay? But it doesn't mean you'll never be able to do one. Well, this is the same thing. So many students, um, because they have difficulty tolerating low rates of reinforcement, um, these are the kind of individuals, they'll only stay in the same place if something intense is happening, like a really fun video game. Then they'll stay where they are and they won't wander. Um, there is seldom a contingency in place, I found, to work continuously with a zero interruptions. And if you do interrupt, it resets. Um, so that's a contingency you can try, and you just start with very short intervals, right? Might even be a minute. You just need them to work for a minute. Don't look up from your paper. Don't ask a question. Don't get up from your seat. Just work for a minute solid. If you have a question, write it down. You can ask me when you're done right? To get people accustomed to working without interrupting. It's a skill. People can be bad at it, but they can get better at it. They can be awesome at it, right? I like to look at it that way. So it may be necessary to initially provide huge reinforcement for nonstop work of short durations, one minute, two minutes, three minutes. If you think they couldn't do a minute, then 30 seconds of continuous work, something like that. So that can be done as well. Um, at the start, individuals, as I said, they could be good or bad at working continuously, but everybody can improve. If you have a contingency, like you get a giant bag of Cheetos, if you just work for three minutes on an easy task without any stopping, you start building the repertoire and building the skill of being able to tolerate lower rates of reinforcement. I can't emphasize this strongly enough as we're going through all this. One of the driving factors, not the only factor, but one driving factor behind all of these problems of being out of area is an inability, not an inability, but a poor ability to tolerate low rates of reinforcement momentarily, right? This is true of a lot of individuals. This is why whoever's going to be watching this recording, when it gets boring, you're going to check your phone. And the reason you're going to check your phone is you need a certain level of reinforcement, a certain rate. And when it drops a little too low, you become uncomfortable. Now, anybody could learn to just sit still and stare at a wall for five minutes and have almost no reinforcement, right? But some people have great difficulty doing anything that even approaches that. So this is just something that can be worked on with individuals, your ability to do anything, not even work per se, but your ability to tolerate low rates of reinforcement and stay there, just 
tolerating the low rate of reinforcement. Individuals who can do that can accomplish all sorts of things, and we would call them patient, right? Uh, so think about it. It's something that you can really, people can improve upon. They may not be good at it. doesn't mean they can't improve. So one tactic relies on reducing the motivation to wander by cleaning up free-floating reinforcement on the environment. Look, if all your reinforcers are locked up, everybody's wearing headphones who's doing anything. Anybody who's looking at a computer has blinders on, right? <laughs> um, and conversations are kept very low, right? And everything else is locked up. Where are you going to wander? Why would you wander? There's nothing to wander over to. If there's 15 different conversations happening in the classroom, if there's 15 people accessing 15 different reinforcers in the classroom, if there are toys and games not locked away, not put away all over the place that anybody could just grab, you're going to have more wandering because there's more reasons to wander. So think about that as well. Cleaning up the environment really helps. Another tactic relies on increasing the motivation to stay where you are. So the task changes from, we just mentioned, most tasks are, I want you to complete the math worksheet, which is good. It's good to complete things. However, they may need this. I need you to do three continuous minutes of math. I don't care if you finish the sheet. I need you to work continuously and try. Do as many problems as you can in three minutes. I don't expect you to finish the sheet. I don't even want you to finish the sheet. I just want you to do as many problems as you can in three minutes, right? That's a different contingency. It's a beat the clock contingency, more like a video game. Uh, it's a challenge. It has a very clear end. You only have to do it for three minutes, right? And it teaches them to stay focused. And if you can do something for three minutes without interrupting yourself, asking questions or making excuses or sharpening your pencil, all right? then you can work for six minutes and then 12 minutes, et cetera. And pretty soon you'd be a good little exam taker. So you see the difference? Very, very important. You might have to start very slow and very small and very big reinforcement to get people accustomed to working continuously with temporarily low rates of reinforcement. Very hard for some people to do. So you remember, you can't continuously do work and wander. If you start wandering, your continuous work has stopped. So let's say you were doing three minutes of continuous work and at one minute and 30 seconds, you get up and look at what somebody else is doing. The clock resets, that's all. That's why you start with really short intervals so people don't get super frustrated. If you have to start the clock over and you only need to do another minute, it's not the end of the world. If you had to start the clock over and do another 30 minutes, somebody's going to be really angry. Okay, uh, intertask wandering. I don't think this is much of a problem and probably transitions are more of a problem, but I just thought I threw it in there. And this is where you get distracted between tasks. You're supposed to go from station A to station B. Now, very well-run classrooms, uh, it looks like a clockwork, one of those old cuckoo clocks where people come out of the door and they like, you know, hit each other and go back inside again. Um, I've seen classrooms where like a bell rings and like little robots, the kids all get up out of their seats, all change stations sit down again and they start working i'm like damn and it's like really impressive you know like a machine like <laughs> and they all go down and every time they do it every time the timer goes off they all go up they walk over nobody's walking to the wrong area everybody walks ex immediately to their next area but one of the reasons this happened is the classroom was incredibly organized in this particular case. And it was so clear where to go. And all the students were on board. So when I go over to my new area, the previous kid is already cleared out, right? So it was pretty cool. Uh, but anyway, the, there's no intertask wandering in this case because it's so clear where you're supposed to go. Your materials are already ready for you. And it's always the same thing. You go from this table to this table to that table, right? So it, in classrooms that are run like that, I think you have a lot less intertask wandering because it's clear. Okay, I did this, boom, I'm going to earn this next thing right over there. Boom, I'm ready to go. I'm going to earn my next thing. It just makes it so much easier to go somewhere and get started, right? Instead of, do you know where your folder is? Do you know where your materials are? Where are you going to do your work? There's more wandering to go on so on there. So not the same as problems with transitions. Um, I usually talk about transitioning problems as you get aggression when you ask someone to go somewhere different. That's a bit different. This is, they they go when you say, okay, it's time for go reading, they go, but on the way there, they become distracted. So it's a little bit different problem. 
Uh, in this case, uh, it's going from one task to another quickly is what you want the person to do. Again, there must be a contingency in which going directly to the next task is reinforced immediately. So as an example, you might have something set up at their next table, like a little treat that they could have. As soon as you get there, you can eat it, right? But maybe there's a limit. That treat is only there for a minute. After a minute, you take it away. So they know if they go to their next station quickly, there'll be a treat there, a gold star, something. But you put what's called a limited hold on it. So it's only available for a minute. If you get there within a minute, you get it. If you don't, eh, you don't. But the point is, there has to be something to encourage changing quickly. And if you do, people will usually follow along. If there's a task preference, you could even do this. If you had five tasks, structure the hardest first, right? That way, as they're transitioning from one task to the next, it's getting easier and easier, meaning transitions that have become more and more likely with fewer and fewer problems. Why? You're transitioning to something that's easier and easier. You'll be less likely to escape and wander. If your day got harder and harder as you went, I would say that the probability of escaping would also increase. So you might want to structure it the reverse way. Much wandering between tasks may be simple avoidance behavior. Uh, as tasks becomes easier, as I said, less motivation to avoid them. So structure them so that they're getting easier. One thing you can do. Out of area. And we only have two more sections, and I'm a little late on my 50-minute um, slide, but we're going to get that in a second. Uh, so out of area, going to a specific location. This happens, too, uh, within the rumor setting and remaining there. So you keep going back to some place that you're not supposed to be. Uh, so you could be out of area observing, out of area participating, or out of area aggravating. Uh, let's take a look at these. So out of area observing is pretty easy. Um, if you're just watching, then it's likely it's a lower level reinforcer. They're just curious, and it's usually easier to redirect the person. If redirection becomes immediately difficult, you may be dealing with a potent reinforcer, and it may take some further assessment. Maybe they really enjoy just watching. If they're out of the area participating, playing, answering questions in the area where they are, then we might have to look at why is this so attractive to them right now? So are there higher rates of reinforcement for there than where there was? There probably are. Um, is it more social than where they were? Are they looking for social reinforcers? Maybe they were alone and they, they went out of area because it was a group. Um, was it a preferred subject or activity? Were people singing? Were people reading? Is it something that's highly preferred by the person, but it wasn't time for them to do it right now? Is it a preferred staff or a teacher at the other area? And they really liked that person. So they didn't really care about what was happening, but they, they care about who was leading the activity. And that's why they were out of area. Um, and there might even be preferred peers at that area. That can happen too. Um, if that were the case, um, if I jump back for a second, sorry. If there were preferred peers at the area, then you'd have to look at how you can let them access those individuals appropriately, how you can let them access that activity appropriately. You might schedule that activity after they complete their first one and just have them do a couple things and then let them go complete that activity. Or you might try to find out what about that activity that they're going over to consistently? What, is the, what are the qualities of it that make it so attractive? And maybe you can use some of those imbue some of those qualities into the current task so that they won't keep escaping. You can do a little analysis of the place where they are out of area, right? Why is it attractive? Why do they like it? What's the reinforcing value? So if you're out of area aggravating, um, there's interaction, but the individual went to the new area specifically seeking what I'll call social signs of damage. So uh, signs of damage usually are physical, like bleeding, you know, tearing your shirt, destroying the room, seeing things broken. But there can be social signs of damage too, as when people tease. So if somebody teases you and go, hey, that's not very nice. My face screws up a little bit. I seem a little sad, a little bit upset. Those would be social signs of damage. It's a sign you've hurt my feelings, right? So a lot of times, if they're out of area aggravating, they're trying to start up with someone and they want some social signs of damage. Uh, so they uh, went to an authorized area to cop some naughty reinforcers. So let's say that they don't like the teacher. They're off on their own. So they come over and they disrupt the lesson because they know it aggravates the teacher. 
and that was the form of reinforcement they were seeking. Typically, this occurs because, again, the individual can't get enough reinforcement for participating properly. So if they're out of the area and then they go over and aggravate another area, usually what it means is they don't have the skills to participate properly because if they do, they'll show off and they'll show how smart they are and they'll answer questions and things like that. If they go over to another area just to start up with people, usually the reason they do that is they can't engage in the behavior that will produce any valued reinforcers like, oh, wow, you're smart. That was a good answer. How did you learn that? Right? They can't get those kinds of interactions. So what they'll do is they'll go over to that group of people <laughs> and just start things going. Uh, they'll start up with people because they have the skills to produce those kinds of reinforcers, but they may not have the academic skills to produce praise and recognition and you're so smart and those kinds of things. So that happens a lot too. So not only is there insufficient reinforcement to keep them in the area where they were, but when they're out of the area, they're seeking these naughty reinforcers. So they're going to be disruptive usually is what happens. Um, now we're at the last part, which is just out of seat. So that's like the tiniest movement you get. We're going, we're going less and less. First, we were like out of the room. Now we're like out of area. Now we're to a specific area. And now we're just out of seat. Okay. Um, so the individual stays in the area, but they're constantly up and down in their seat. So they're at the table. They're at their desk, but they're up and down and up and down and up and down. Uh, so uh, sometimes it's task avoidance. And by the way, out of seat and back in seat constantly is usually more of a problem with a therapist in session with someone next to them. Because usually what happens is when the kid stands up, the session is interrupted momentarily, and then they want to get them seated again before they resume. So typically standing temporarily interrupts. Like I don't see this. When the kid stands, I don't see the therapist standing and continuing with the prompt. I see the therapist sitting and asking the kid to come back down again. So usually standing provides some momentary escape. Right um, now, it may be that they don't hate the task, but they just um, it's aversive for them to sit still for very long. So out of out of seat is avoidance. If it's up and down out of the seat in place, this is sometimes more, as I said, an individual therapy session problem where the individual has a high academic demand. Touch blue. Show me chicken. Where's your nose? Um, I, and those are the kinds of ones where I've seen people popping up and down a lot, like prairie dogs, um, meerkats. So the out of seat behavior typically provides a brief break, pardon me, from demands and sometimes access to self stim. So I have seen many times individuals stand up so they can body rock better, right? Or flip their hand or something like that. So they'll stand up and stim and have to be brought back down again. So you'll see some of that too. If the out of seat is maintained by task avoidance or interruption, then teaching a man for a different activity is appropriate instead of standing up. Maybe they man to do something else. It's also helpful to increase reinforcement for the frequency, magnitude, and to increase prompt levels to make the task easier. Usually, if the reinforcement goes pretty fast and it's coming pretty fast and the instructions come fast and there's not a lot of downtime, people tend to be able to stay seated better. Um, you'll usually see them pop up more when people are pausing between requests or things like that. Um, what about if, if people just need more motor activity? They just, after a while, people just can't sit anymore or they just um, want to change positions. I've taught classes before where people would tell me ahead of time, please um, uh, don't take it personally if I have to stand up. It's not that I don't like your lectures. It's just I can't sit very long comfortably. And they would just stand for a while and they'd be fine. And they would sit back down again. So some people may need some motor activity. Maybe they just don't want to sit for so long if they were sitting a long time. If the individual is higher functioning and working independently and is constantly up and down, then it may be more of a motor activity need. Okay. Um, this is where standing desks come in. Uh, at a standing desk, you can fidget more, you can rock back and forth more, you have a lot more range of movement than if you're locked into a traditional desk chair, okay, where I've got the thing here, and I'm locked in behind it. There's not a lot of room to move. And so that's maybe where standing desk comes in. Um, I've heard of cases where the, uh, the kids have foot fidget bars. And while you're standing, 
you put your foot on that bar and you swing it back and forth and it allows you to do some motor stuff without even going anywhere. So for if they just strictly wanted some motor activity, but you want them to stay where they are, that's kind of a decent thing. That's a decent compromise. Uh, one teacher, I thought it was very clever. She arranged because she didn't want him to go out of area. He was out of seat, but she was like, as long as he does his work, I really don't care if he's out of seat, which is quite reasonable, right? So she did the finger on the chair contingency. As long as he had his finger on his chair, I'll just demonstrate it looked like this. So he had to have one finger on the chair the entire time. So he's like doing his work and he walks over to the other side, he does this. And he's like playing a little game with it. And he's writing over here and then he's back over here and he's doing this. But he did stay next to his chair. And although it was a little bit annoying because he was really pushing it, he kept a finger on the chair. And it allowed him all kinds of flexibility and where he wanted to stand or what he wanted to do. And it solved the teacher's problem of he's not in the area where he shouldn't be anymore. And he and she solved his problem, which is I don't want to be locked in this chair for 50 minutes. Right. So um, that's a nice compromise. If it's more of a I just need to move around a little bit. Right. So summary. Um, first of all, we don't want our kids running from us. <laughs> we want them running to us, as Jim Partington said, uh, to various degrees, not being where you should be in general, right, reflects low rates of reinforcement where you are. Usually, if the rates of reinforcement are very high where you are, you don't tend to leave those places. Um, behavior goes where reinforcement flows. When rates of reinforcement become too low and or aversive stimulation becomes too high, everyone escapes. Now, you may escape in different ways. So some of us escape by using words. Hey, this really isn't in my job description. Uh, I don't know if it's appropriate for me to be doing this task. That's how we escape. We don't run out of the boardroom. <laughs> okay. We use our words to escape. I don't think this is in my position description, but that's escape motivated too. Um, if you don't know how to do things like that with your words, maybe you run out of the room. <clears throat> so where do we escape to is an issue. And that's usually places with lower rates of aversives and higher rates of reinforcement. Uh, if you want to contact me for any follow-up or anything like that, there's my email. It's Merrill at WinstonBehavioralSolutions.com. And for your certificate of completion, Thank you for participating in this webinar. To obtain a certificate of completion, you must fill out the form at the certificate of completion link provided on the email for this training. Please write down this code as it will be required to receive your certificate of completion. The code is MW, which happens to be my initials, 12-20-22. MW, 12-20-22. Uh, thank you very much for attending, and you can contact FAU Card uh, at this number. There is their email, and there is their website, and thank you very much for attending.